Okay. Maybe I do Oh yeah, no. John Schmidt, give the introductions first. Yeah. And then you can come up. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you, John. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to today's uh, third panel. Um, I'm John Schmidt from the Center for Economic and Policy Research. And uh, today's final panel is entitled Charting the Path Forward, Identifying Policy Initiatives and Regional Financial and Economic, uh, economic Developments. Uh, we have three speakers today who will be speaking for 15 to 20 minutes each, uh, followed by a question and answer. Uh, our first speaker today is Dr. Wara Pat, who is the Principal Economist and director in the Secretariat Office of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, ASEAN, uh, in Jakarta. He has worked there for over eight years, coordinating regional cooperation activities and initiatives in finance and economics, st statistics, science, uh, and technology, and, and infrastructure. Uh, he's currently coordinating the overall implementation of the ASEAN economic community, as well as several other economic cooperation initiatives in East Asia. He'll be speaking today on regional initiatives for financial stability in ASEAN and East Asia. Our second speaker today is Professor Eileen Grable, who is an economist and director of the graduate program in global trade, finance, and economic integration in the Graduate School of International Studies at the University of Denver. Uh, she is, among other things, the co-author with uh, Hajun Chang of Reclaiming Development, an Alternative Policy Manual. and. Uh, in uh, 2005 and 2006, she was the recipient of the United Methodist Church University Scholar Teacher of the Year Award. So uh, we're in for a treat. Uh, and she will be speaking, the title of her talk today is uh, One Step Forward, Two Steps Back, Policy and Coherence in Financial Crises. Uh, our final speaker will be uh, Nelson Barbosa, who is the Secretary of Economic Monitoring for the Brazilian uh, Ministry of Finance and also a professor at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, he has, his research is focused on financial policies in Brazil and Argentina, exchange rate coordination in Latin America, and financial fragility in Brazil. Uh, he will be talking today on reintroducing growth and development into macroeconomic policy, the Brazilian economy after the Asian financial crisis. So again, thank you very much, and I'd like to ask uh, our first speaker, Dr. Warpat, please. Thank you. Thank you, John. It's uh, usually tough to speak in the afternoon right after lunch, and, and I'm not talking about the audience. So uh, allow me to thank the uh, organizer for inviting me to this conference and also for letting me be the first speaker in this afternoon session. Um, <clears throat> my, my presentation will focus on ASEAN and ASEAN Plus 3 initiatives in response to the financial crisis in 1997-98. And I would like to focus on four key regional initiatives um, and these are aimed to prevent future financial crises one under ASEAN and three under the ASEAN plus three uh, cooperation framework. Uh, two of them involve macroeconomic surveillance and these are the ASEAN surveillance process <coughs> and the ASEAN plus three economic review and policy dialogue. Um, the other two initiatives, um, of course you have heard this morning uh, two speakers have referred to them and these are the Shiamai initiative and this is aimed to enhance the region's capacity to deal with the balance of payment difficulties. While the Asian Bond Markets Initiative, or the ABMI for short, aims to develop local bond markets. And this is to address the currency and maturity mismatches that are believed to be uh, contributing to the latest financial crisis. Let me start with the ASEAN surveillance process. Following the APEC initiative in November 1997 to set up the Manila framework as a concerted approach to restoring financial stability in the region, the ASEAN finance ministers decided at that meeting in February 1998 to establish their own surveillance mechanism. 
a term of understanding for the ASEAN 7th process, was prepared and subsequently endorsed by the special ASEAN finance ministers meeting here in Washington, D.C. on 5th December 1998. Under the terms of understanding on the ASP, the ASEAN finance ministers wanted the process to be informal, simple, and based on the peer review process. They also want this uh, mechanism to be complementary to the global surveillance exercise undertaken by the IMF. Uh, to promote closer economic review and policy dialogue, the ministers agreed to share a set of baseline data as provided to the IMF during the Article 4 consultation mission and decided to include a regular agenda to discuss surveillance matters at their annual meeting. To coordinate the ASP or the ASEAN Surveillance Process, a small unit was set up at the ASEAN Secretariat to monitor global and regional economic and financial developments and coordinate all surveillance related activities, including preparing the annual ASEAN Surveillance Report. The ASEAN Surveillance Report analyzes recent economic and financial developments, including the progress of economic and financial reforms identifies any emerging or increasing vulnerability and raises key policy issues for the consideration of the ASEAN finance and central bank deputies and the ASEAN finance ministers during their peer review. Now this ASP and in particular the peer review is meant to ensure the consistency of macroeconomic policies within the region. It is also designed to spot early any emerging risk or vulnerabilities and to take timely policy actions as required. Now let me turn to the ASEAN plus three surveillance process. Um, now in recognition of the need to enhance monitoring of the economic situation in the ASEAN plus three countries in support of the Chiang Mai initiative, which I will elaborate later, um, the ASEAN plus three finance ministers decided in 2002 to establish their own macroeconomic surveillance mechanism under the economic review and policy dialogue. Uh, this is in addition to the ASEAN surveillance process uh, that has been established a few years earlier. Under the ERPD, the ASEAN plus three finance ministers meet once a year and their deputies uh, meet twice a year to discuss economic and financial development in their countries as well as any emerging policy issues. Participation in this process is voluntary, uh, but all countries are now participating in this regular dialogue. The arrangement for the ERPD is a bit different from the ASP in that each country prepares its own economic report based on a common template and presents it at the meeting. Um, there are Q&A sessions <coughs> after every country presentation to provide opportunity uh, for clarification and exchange of views on policy issues. The interactive dialogue is complemented by the IMF and the ADB presentations on regional economic outlook and risk. Since last May, uh, a group of experts had, had been established to carry out in-depth studies on issues of economic and financial vulnerabilities and concerns for the region. At the same time, the Technical Working Group on Economic and Financial Monitoring, or on the slide ETWG, has also been set up uh, to enhance national surveillance capacities of each member, as well as to promote the development of early warning system. Now next, the CMI initiative, or CMI for short. Now in May 2000 in Chiang Mai, the ASEAN plus three finance ministers discussed how to develop a regional financing arrangement that can be utilized to maintain financial stability in the East Asian region. 
At that time, the ASEAN swap arrangement was being expanded to include all ASEAN countries and enlarged to one billion US dollars. The uh, finance ministers decided to combine this expanded ASEAN swap arrangement with a network of bilateral swap arrangements of BSAs uh, among ASEAN plus three countries to establish the first regional financing arrangement called the GMI Initiative. <clears throat> now, with the ASEAN swap arrangement and this network of parallel swaps, the CMI serves as the region's self-help and support mechanism that provides short-term liquidity support to members that may be experiencing balance of payment difficulties. It is intended to be a quick disbursing facility for short-term liquidity support as a first line of defense, but supplemental to international financing facilities such as that of the IMF. Today, the CMI comprises uh, the $2 billion US dollars ASEAN swap arrangement and the network of 16 bilateral swaps among eight ASEAN plus three countries with a combined size of $80 billion US dollars. Now, this slide shows the network of the existing BSAs under the CMI as of last month. I hope you can see <laughs> from back there. <clears throat> well, I, I blame the screen for that. Um, most of the BSAs are now two ways, and with the first 20% eligible for drawdown without the linkage to the IMF program. Now, this morning, <coughs> I think David and another speaker mentioned about the, the next phase of this Chiang Mai initiative. <coughs> and uh, this is to enhance the effectiveness of the CMI going forward. Um, even though the facility has not yet been activated, thankfully, uh, the ASEAN Plus Three Finance Ministers uh, announced their intention to multilateralize the facility uh, through what they call a self-managed reserve pooling arrangement and, and to be governed by a single contractual agreement. Now, the key elements of this arrangement have yet to be worked out, however, uh, and these include the size of the facility, the borrowing quota, the activation mechanism, surveillance, and reserve eligibility. At present, the, the key surveillance mechanism is the ERPD that is supported by the group of experts and the ETWG. Now, um, <clears throat> On the Asian Bond Markets Initiative, uh, it was believed that too much reliance on bank financing and easy access to dollars uh, financing, many of which are short term, um, <clears throat> are key factors contributing to the latest financial crisis. And this prompted a number of regional initiatives aimed at further developing the bond markets. Some of these include the initiatives by the EMIP the Executive Meeting of East Asia and Pacific Central Banks, and APEC. The EMIP's Asian Bond Fund focuses on demand side, with its two funds, ABF 1 and 2, investing in government bonds of some of its members. The APEC Regional Bond Market Development Initiative focuses on development of regional bond markets, including securitization and credit guarantee mechanism. For ASEAN Plus Three, the Asian Bond Markets Initiative aims at mitigating maturity and currency mismatches that I mentioned earlier. And <clears throat> this uh, will be done through the promotion of local currency denominated bonds. As a region with surplus savings, the ABMI is hoped to also facilitate channeling of regional savings to meet the region's investment need, particularly in the infrastructure development. Now, implementation of the ABMI 
follows a two-pronged approach. First is to widen the issuer's base, promoting more local currency-denominated bonds issued by a greater variety of issuers. Second is to create an enabling environment or market infrastructure that facilitates both the issuance of as well as investment in bonds. To widen as well as deepen the local bond markets, the ABMI aims to initially promote the local currency denominated bonds issued by foreign companies and international agencies that have presence in the country as well as by government financial institutions and agencies. It is also promoting issuance of more sophisticated or structured bonds such as through securitization. To facilitate those issues, there is a need to create an enabling environment that would attract both issuers and investors to the region. For example, um, credit guarantee will allow certain type of underlying assets such as SME loans to appeal to a wider group of investors while enhancing the SME's access to the bond markets. A well-functioning derivative market will also allow investors to hedge their exchange rate risk. Information asymmetry is another factor that may deter investment in the region's bond markets, particularly by non-residents. So it's important to enhance this information dissemination to promote greater transparency. Credit, credible credit rating also contributes to greater transparency and disclosure. In the longer term, closer collaboration among credit rating agencies in the region will pave ways towards harmonizing credit rating methods and scale that would facilitate cross-border issuance of bonds. While existing settlement systems are adequate for the purpose of investing and trading in local currency denominated bonds, linking them together would enhance access to, regi to the region's bond markets and allow new products to tap a much wider investor's base. Now, the, another important step in this initiative is to reduce the development gaps on bond market infrastructure through capacity building. Now, this slide shows some of the issues that came into the market to date, and these include the Collateralized bond applications with SME loans and student loans as underlying assets in Korea. Asset-backed securities issued by China Development Bank and China Construction Bank. Um, in Malaysia, there was residential mortgage-backed securities and ADB bonds. There was also Panda bonds in China and Peso bonds in the Philippines issued by the ADB. Uh, Panda bonds was also issued by the IFC. In addition to that, um, ADB and JBIC also issued Thai baht bonds in Thailand. And the government also promoted the Thai baht Asian bonds issued by the government, non-listed state-owned enterprises, and specialized financial institutions by exempting the income from these uh, issues from withholding tax requirements. And, and lately, uh, last year, the ADB launched this 10 billion US dollars Asian currency note program that will allow the bank to issue Asian currency bonds in the Asia domestic markets under a single unified framework with a common set of documents governed by English law. As for the second prong, uh, first is the with withholding tax exemption uh, for non-resident investors that is already effective in Malaysia and Thailand. And Japan Bank for International Cooperation, or JBIC, has provided guarantees for CBOs and corporate bonds issued in Thailand, Malaysia, and Indonesia. Um, to enhance the effectiveness of information dissemination, the ADB has set up an Asian Bonds online website to act as a conduit for disseminating the relevant information and statistics on the bond markets in ASEAN plus three countries, as well as the progress and outcome
of the implementation of the ABMI. The website also includes the Asian bond indicators and Asian bond monitor. I'm sure um, at least some of you have visited this website. I hope I assume correctly. <laughs> well, anyway, um, <clears throat> this is a very useful website with a lot of information on, on the bond, <coughs> bond markets in ASEAN Plus 3. So if you haven't visited, I would encourage you to do so. Um, now, in the implementation of the MI, ABMI activities, the private sector has also been invited to participate where possible, and this is to solicit their views and support. Um, in the past, private sectors have been invited to participate in the seminars and workshops on credit rating and local currency denominated bonds issued by IFIs and multinational corporations. Okay, and this is my, oh sorry, um, this is my last slide. <coughs> now, um, the ABMI is an ongoing process, and a lot of, a lot of issues uh, have to be explored. Um, <coughs> And uh, over the past few years, a number of studies have been conducted, <coughs> and these include the studies on credit guarantee and investment mechanism, the regional settlement linkages called Asia Link, as well as impediments across border bond issuance and investment. Studies are also conducted on <coughs> how to minimize foreign exchange settlement risk in the ASEAN Plus 3 region, and on the regional basket currency bond, or RBCB, on this slide. Uh, going forward, further studies will be conducted on new debt instruments for infrastructure financing, on securitization of loan credits and receivables, and on Asian medium-term note program. At the same time, capacity building is being provided to less advanced countries to develop their bond markets. It is being implemented through a variety of t technical assistance, both bilaterally and multilaterally. Countries with more advanced systems are also providing assistance and sharing their experiences. In the longer term, um, we may see bonds denominated in basket of regional currencies offered to international as well as regional investors as efforts to create an enabling environment and improve infrastructure continue. This might include a possible common approach to withholding taxes, and the establishment of regional credit guarantee and investment facility and linkages among the region's settlement systems. So allow me to stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Eileen Grable. Can I I'll just close the laptop? Thank you all very much, and let me just um, also thank the organizers of this conference, particularly Bumika, for all of her hard work and for the co-sponsoring organizations as well. Um, I think the earlier panels today, the, the ones we had before lunch, really clearly elucidated the lessons of the East Asian financial crisis, um, and in my view in particular, I think the comments by Robert Wade, by Jomo, and by Mark Weisbrot um, were quite compelling to me because they focused on the role of misguided programs of internal and external financial liberalization in the crisis. What I'd like to add to that discussion of causes of the crisis um, is the fact that I think in many important respects, the Asian financial crisis was a repeat of earlier events in Mexico just a few years prior. Former IMF managing director Michel Camdesu, I think, had it right when he dubbed the Mexican debacle of 1994-1995 the first financial crisis of the 21st century. The Asian crisis was much more serious and much more surprising than the events in Mexico uh, because the Asian crisis um, occurred in countries that were hailed as miracles right up until they imploded. Um, the Asian crisis, of course, was followed by other financial crises like those in Turkey, Brazil, Poland, Russia, and Argentina. 
I do want to be careful to acknowledge that each one of these crises obviously had a slightly different ideology, uh, but I do want to make clear that it's nonetheless true that each of these crises occurred in the financially fragile environments that were fueled by the speculative booms that were made possible by programs of internal and external financial liberalization in all of these economies. Now, it's interesting to me that faced with this cumulative evidence of policy failure and the evidence of the human misery that were associated with all of these various crises, economists in the academic and in the policy community ultimately seem to have learned something uh, from these events, particularly from the events in Asia. Uh, granted, some economists were slow learners. Uh, the slow learners did quite well for themselves uh, for a while in all of the various cottage industries that sprung up after each one of the crises. Uh, they shared with wide audiences the serious problems that they came to see as deeply rooted and pervasive, um, albeit somehow undetected by international investors and policymakers who extolled the virtues of these model economies. And here I'm referring uh, to those that gave crisis postmortems that focused on the role of corruption, cronyism, and malfeasance, on misguided programs of government intervention, on nostalgic attachments to pegged exchange rates, and on inadequate information about the true conditions of firms and governments in the crisis-afflicted economies. Now, the informational inadequacy crowd, I think, had perhaps the highest, uh, the, the biggest reach in the policy community. Their views dominated the agenda at the G7 Halifax Summit in 1995, the work of the Ray Committee that was later formed after the Halifax Summit, and this informational inadequacy crowd promoted a variety of early warning systems, such as the widely known early warning system devote, uh, developed by Goldstein, Kaminsky, and Reinhardt, and this focus on informational inadequacy as a cause of crisis uh, was also a prime mover behind the IMF's creation of the Special Data Dissemination Standard and all of the variants on that that later uh, came to be known as the Financial Action Strategy Task Force. There were several different versions of this SDSS. And later, of course, the move to incorporate assessments by credit rating agencies in the global financial architecture, I think, also reflected the reach of the informational inadequacy argument. Now, ultimately, the slow learners came to acknowledge, I think at least to an extent, that there was something also to be learned from countries like India, Chile, Colombia, and Malaysia, all of which were able to weather the period of turbulence successfully. Now, among these experiences, I think the most important drivers of a change in conventional wisdom were Malaysia's deployment of temporary stringent capital controls, Chile's use as what became known as market-friendly capital controls that were adjusted in response to changing market conditions and identified channels of evasion, and China and India's approach to financial integration and financial liberalization that we can describe as gradualist in its orientation. And with a few exceptions, I think most notably prominent academics Ronald McKinnon and Sebastian Edwards, the new conventional wisdom um, could be stated, I think, inelegantly in the following way, and it is that unrestrained financial liberalization, especially concerning international private capital flows, can aggravate or induce macroeconomic vulnerabilities that often culminate in crisis. That, I think, is the new conventional wisdom, and then that following from that, the other component of the new conventional wisdom is that subject to, and I think we can all fill in the numerous caveats, um, subject to these caveats, temporary market-friendly controls over international capital movements can play an important role in mitigating the risk of financial crises in developing countries. Notably, a widely circulated report by a team of IMF economists, and that report has been referred to several times today. This is the famous Kenneth Rogoff et al. report. This report received a lot of attention for reaching these kinds of startling findings. And since then, there have been a number of other prominent papers by high-profile mainstream economists that have really reached complementary conclusions. And just for example, Jagdish Bhagwati's work, I think, is notable in this connection. 
And so perhaps the most lasting and most important effect of this decade of crises is that the center of gravity has largely shifted away from an unequivocal fundamentalist opposition to any interference with the free flow of capital to a kind of tepid conditional support for some types of capital controls under some circumstances. And I think this shift moves policy discussions in the right direction, but in my view, the weak new consensus, I think, is not adequate to the task of preventing an Asian crisis redue. And I think there are a couple of reasons why the new consensus is not adequate. Um, it, it really doesn't um, move us more than one step forward, I think, as concerns the task of actually preventing the next Asian crisis. And let me mention um, a couple of reasons why I think that's the case. The first has to do with an inconsistency between the policy lessons of these crises and the content of recent bi- and multilateral trade and investment agreements. These agreements codify what's referred to these days um, with a new buzzword of policy coherence, and I know Aldo um, is here. Um, the term policy coherence on the face of it seems innocuous and sensible since an incoherent policy regime hardly has much to recommend it. Uh, but there's a problem here. I think these new trade and investment agreements have become a new Trojan horse for bringing developing countries in line with fundamentalist and outdated ideals about internal and external financial liberalization. Indeed, the bilateral and multilateral trade and investment agreements go much further in instituting neoliberal financial reform and an expansive notion of investor rights than even has the IMF in the recent past or at present. These agreements establish mechanisms that punish developing countries for taking entirely reasonable actions to prevent or even to respond to financial crises. These punishments take the form of legal actions by foreign investors in international dispute settlement bodies against signatories that deploy temporary capital controls of any sort. And examples of prohibited measures would include steps to make foreign capital sticky during times of crisis, temporary suspensions of currency convertibility, adjustment in the exchange rate, and a variety of commonplace macroeconomic and social policies that can now be interpreted as being tantamount to the expropriation of foreign investment. I think there's a lot more to be said about this, but in the interest of time, I'll just also mention that these same types of trade and investment agreements preclude many important types of developmental financial policies, they limit the opportunity for institutional and policy heterogeneity, and they frustrate the right of countries to engage in policy experimentation. All of these are critical components of successful development experiences. For these reasons, these agreements introduce a new kind of dangerous policy incoherence Financial crises, I think, are increasingly likely today as a consequence of the outdated ideologies and financial instruments, uh, and financial is, um, interests, rather, that are driving trade and investment agreements. So these two steps back, I think, come just when IMF researchers and the community of international and development economists, I think, seem to have absorbed some of the key lessons about prevention and lessons about defensive policies from this decade of financial crises. Now, a second reason why I think uh, the, the new consensus um, doesn't go far enough in preventing Asian-style financial crises is another second dimension of incoherence. And this second dimension of incoherence, um, by saying that, what I'm referring to is a kind of strange disconnect between IMF research since the East Asian crisis and IMF's own practice when it comes to Article IV negotiations with developing countries. The latter, I think, seem to be moving on a track that's entirely orthogonal to the institution's own research on financial integration and financial crisis. A third reason why we shouldn't be satisfied with the new post-crisis policy consensus is that even were that consensus to be operationalized on the level of policy, I think it doesn't go far enough. The new consensus doesn't endorse the case for increasing substantially the policy space of developing countries when it comes to promoting financial stability, 
Moreover, it doesn't place policies that promote financial stability squarely at the center of a policy agenda that harnesses the resources of domestic and international capital markets in the service of economic and human development. Policies that reduce the likelihood of financial crisis or enable countries to respond to crises, I think are necessary co-requisites to other developmental financial policies because they protect the policy space and they also protect the achievements of developmental financial policies. And just in the interest of time and to stay focused um, on the subject of this panel, I'll just note that I and certainly other academics have uh, described many types of developmental financial policies in, in our research and these kinds of policies that we've looked at are policies of credit allocation, tax, tax incentives or quotas that are aimed at promoting lending to priority groups or to priority projects, the role of development banks, credit guarantee schemes or subsidies that reduce risk premia on medium and long-term lending, partnerships between informal and formal financial institutions, new institutions to channel credit to underserved populations and regions, asset-based reserve requirements, and employment targeting for central banks. These are just some examples of what some of us have called developmental financial policies. And so where do we go from here? Where does all of this leave academics, policymakers, and civil society groups that are interested in learning from the decade of financial crises to prevent future recurrences? There are a couple of issues um, that I want to throw out for discussion. Developing countries need to rethink seriously their participation in trade and investment agreements that constrain their ability to protect themselves from and respond to financial crises. The costs of these agreements, I think, are quite clear, and the benefits of these agreements are at best negligible, especially because there is no empirical evidence that these agreements actually enhance trade or investment flows to the developing world. There are good reasons for policymakers in rich countries to take seriously the reasons why some ASEAN leaders have proposed from time to time, and we've certainly heard about um, updates to these proposals, the creation of an Asian monetary fund, and we should also take seriously the fact that some large countries in the Americas may well bolt the IMF in favor of the Bank of the South that's being proposed by Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez. However, we might debate the real or the hypothetical costs and benefits of these various initiatives. I think we have to recognize that their currency stems directly from the serious inadequacies of the IMF's work with countries during the decade of financial crises. In addition, the currency of these alternative institutional initiatives stems from the Bretton Woods institution's loss of legitimacy and credibility and from the failure of their leadership to promote reforms that enhance country ownership and governance structures that enhance institutional transparency and the voice, voice of Southern members and, of course, the comments uh, from the speaker before lunch notwithstanding. I think what, what else can we say specifically about a policy agenda that builds directly on lessons from the decade of crisis? It's clear to me that financial policies in developing countries have to focus on generating, mobilizing, and allocating capital to the kinds of projects that have the largest developmental payoff and that ameliorate important social ills. Moreover, the time is ripe to take seriously the fact that controls over international capital movements are a critical supporting player in the broader financial landscape. Controls also reduce the risk of investor flight, the risk of financial crises, and consequent involvement with the IMF, and in doing so, create space for policy experimentation and for policy and institutional diversity. And just by way of illustrating one possible framework for capital controls, I want to mention that in some of my own work, most recently in a paper that I wrote for the G24, I developed a proposal for what I term tripwires and speed bumps. By tripwires, I'm referring to an indicator of a looming financial difficulty, such as the reversal of portfolio investment or foreign bank lending, the vulnerability to a financial contagion that originates elsewhere in the world, or the vulnerability to debt distress caused by a locational or a maturity mismatch. In this approach, policymakers would design tripwires that target their own country's unique financial and macroeconomic vulnerabilities, 
And once a tripwire identified a particular vulnerability, a graduated speed bump would be activated. For example, in the case of a tripwire that revealed a vulnerability to the reversal of portfolio investment, the appropriate speed bump would slow the entrance of new inflows until more investment could be financed domestically. And I should note here that the early warning systems that were originally developed after the Asian crisis didn't incorporate any institutional response that would constrain the behavior of financial actors, that is what I'm calling speed bumps. And that's because the early warning models were motivated by the idea that crises were significantly motivated by informational inadequacies. Therefore, the mere provision of information could induce market correcting behaviors by financial actors. Now, we're, we're now a decade on from the Asian financial crisis. And my concern, it should now be clear, is that we've not used that time wisely. We have the understanding and the means necessary to prevent a recurrence. And it's so terribly disappointing that the political will that could have been mobilized in the wake of the Asian crisis may have by now been dissipated without any substantial crisis preventing, preventing reform. Instead of in meaningful kinds of reform, I think we face today increasing efforts to lock in financial liberalism, leaving the world financial order perhaps even more precarious than it was a decade ago. One step forward, two steps back. I'm afraid um, that it's hard to make sense of the past 10 years of international financial mismanagement in any other way. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very our much. final speaker is uh, Nelson Barbosa. First, I want to thank the Woodrow Wilson Center for inviting me to this conference, and I have a very difficult task to close and keep all of you awake after the lunch and after this long conference that we have, but obviously with very interesting presentations and papers. To do that, what I want to do is to present, to close this conference on the Asian crisis, presenting a brief history of what happened in the other side of the world. I will, I change a little bit the, the title of my talk and included Argentina also in the picture just to make it more interesting and just try to connect what was happening the uh, different countries in different situations but in the same world environment facing similar problems and somehow their macroeconomic fates connected in 1997 and they are trying they are increasingly connected in uh, right now uh, as first of all to start as Aline mentioned the East Asian crisis was not a new crisis for Latin America because it already happened in Mexico in 1994. Actually, uh, in the early 1990s, the main Latin American economies resorted to an appreciated exchange rate, exchange rate pack to reduce and stabilize inflation. High inflation was a chronic problem in Latin America, in Mexico, Brazil, and Argentina during the 1980s. Reducing and stabilizing inflation was the main priority uh, in the recent uh, democratic elected government. And the first attempt started with Mexico's stabilization pact in 1987, which gained force in 1989, precisely when uh, international interest rates start, start to, to fall and create the liquidity boom in the world economy that allowed an exchange rate pact to be sustained. The next one in line was Argentina with its convertibility plan in 1991. Brazil was the last one with its real plan, real named after the currency that was introduced during that year, in 1994. Actually, the Mexican experiment ended up in a currency crisis way before the Asian crisis, 1994-1995. What are the logic of these stabilization plans? Well, they pretty much reflected the consensus of that time, the Washington consensus. For Latin America, that meant low international interest rates, which allowed, as I said, uh, a stabilization attempt based on 
on exchange rate pack, high domestic interest rates to attract short-term capital flows. The idea at that time was that short-term capital flows were the first to come, then foreign direct investment will come. And appreciate the exchange rate, obviously to reduce inflation. So we reduce the price of tradable goods, and that becomes an anchor for domestic prices. Financial liberalization so that the interest rate arbitrage becomes possible. Privatization on the sense not only to attract foreign capital, but also on the logic that that will increase the competitiveness of the economy. Trade opening also to increase the competitiveness of the economy and reduce the price of tradable goods. What was the logic? That obviously will create uh, current account deficits, or at least reduce the current account surplus. The discourse at the time that was, was that this was only a temporary phenomenon, while the economy moved to a more favorable position. It's like a competitiveness shock. You expose the economy to a competitiveness shock, you take the window of opportunity of foreign finance to modernize your economy. As we all know, that didn't happen. Uh, what was the situation in 1997, the year of the East Asian crisis? Both countries have high current account deficits, have deteriorating public finance. Why? Because the, real, the high real interest rates were causing an increase in public debt, the debt-GDP ratio. A high dependency on speculative capital inflows, and as the situation becomes more and more clearly unsustainable, privatization becomes an instrument of less resort. The Brazilian, one of the reasons that the Brazilian currency crisis didn't happen earlier was that the privatization of the telecommunications company in 1998 uh, resulted in a major inflow of foreign capital. So it allowed the system to survive for another 12 months. There was a perverse adjustment to trade and financial liberalization. Instead of happening, of we having an investment boom, investment grew, but it did not grow at the same pace as consumption. What we have is a consumption boom, which is what you would expect if you have a, a, an economy that is moving from a high inflation to a low inflation because you have the reduction of the inflationary tax, and you also have the appreciation of the exchange rate. Real wages go up, consumption go up, go up faster than investment. What you have is a reduction of domestic savings in an increase in foreign savings, a substitution of savings instead of an increase in total investment. And what happens also, uh, in what was also the situation at that time, is that Argentina actually started having problems before the Asian crisis. Argentina started to have problems after the Mexican crisis, 1995. But then Brazil came to rescue. Brazil adopted its plan in 1994, and then it has a three years of high growth for our standards, of course, not for Asian standards. And that helped Argentina, uh, led, uh, created a major increase in the Argentine exports to Brazil. So Argentina becomes very dependent on the Brazilian expansion. What were the first spec impacts of this Asian crisis? Well, obviously, speculative capital outflows. Brazilian reserves fell for something, something around $70 billion to $30 billion in a matter of three, four months. There was a further increase in the already high domestic real interest rates. In an attempt to defend the currency, the Brazilian government, the Brazilian Central Bank at that time, at the end of 1997 and the beginning of 1998, increased our domestic base interest rates to almost 50%. In real terms, that meant 42% annual. So it's like a low and sharking rate, but set by the central bank. So it was an attempt to make the arbitrage more costly, so to defend the currency. There was obviously because of this an explosive increase in public debt. Why? Because major parts of the Brazilian debt at that time was indexed to the interest rates. So when you increase the interest rates, that automatically rose. There was a growth deceleration. Actually, the impacts of the Brazilian crisis actually started before. 1998, we already started to, f to feel these impacts. Fiscal tightening, the government started to target, the, to set itself to, to, to increase our primary surplus, which is the budget, uh, the government budget excluding interest rate payments. And there was a peculiarity of Brazil is that why did the crisis didn't happen just after the East Asian crisis at the end of 1997? Because of the Brazilian political business cycle. Obviously, the authorities at that time will not say it, but the major perception in the media and in the financial markets was that the government will not develop 12 months before a presidential election, a presidential where elections were set to happen in October 1998. So that led to a major and short speculative wave on the Brazilian currency. As I said, international reserves fell to $30 billion, and then 
In response to this increase in interest rates, it rose to $80 billion by the mid of 1998. Then you have the Russian crisis. What, will ha what was happening? Uh, in order to attract capital in 1998 in a clear and sustainable situation, the Brazilian government has to create a substitute for the dollar. To convince people to put money in Brazil, what they did is to issue a lot of debt, domestic debt, indexed to the U.S. dollars. So that kind of protected the investor from a devaluation. As a result, it's obviously increased the, increased the financial fragility of the economy. It resolved the problem in the short term, but it increased the financial fragility of the economy. And then in September 1998, you had the, you, we had the Russian crisis, which led again to a major capital outflow from Brazil. This time, we sorted to the, the IMF, uh, the Clinton administration, together with the IMF, organized a, main, a major financial loan to Brazil, was a kind of syndicated loan, the IMF, the, tr the U.S. Treasury, the World Bank, the Inter-American Development Bank. If I'm correct, this was something close to $52 billion. It was more of a line of credit. Of those, we used immediately $10 billion. Anyway, the situation was clearly unsustainable, and uh, because of some minor political events that one governor of a major state in Brazil said that he would default on that state's foreign debt, that led to a major uh, uh, capital outflow again at the beginning of 1999, and at that time, the government already re-elected, decided to let the exchange rate go. What were the impacts of this Brazilian, the Brazilian crisis on Brazil and Argentina? There was a mild growth deceleration in Brazil. Why? Because the growth deceleration started before, started in 1998, after the East Asian crisis. There was a deep recession in Argentina. Because Argentina was also, as I said, growing increasingly dependent on the level of economic activity in Brazil. There was a change, major change in the macro, macro policy mix in Brazil. Brazil moved to a floating exchange rate regime, adopted inflation targeting in order to provide a nominal anchor to domestic prices, and increased the, its primary surplus, a moderate fiscal austerity. Was the, the primary surplus was not increased uh, substantially in the, in the first time, but then it rose gradually. Argentina decided to continue with a fixed exchange rate, a fiscal and monetary contraction. What we f say was a race to the bottom. Argentine, Argentina, after the East Asian crisis, and, until, and the process that will result in the Argentine crisis was a classic case where the government tries to cut, to promote fiscal adjustment, cutting uh, government spending, GDP falls, foreign revenues falls, and then you have to do another cut. It's a race to the bottom where you end up in a recession. Uh, what was the logic of that, the, the, the interpretation at that time of the Washington Consensus? is obviously that the Argent, uh, the Argentina had an uh, appreciated exchange rate. And one, the, what, the way the government can correct this is to develop, increase the normal exchange rate, or reduce domestic prices. At that time, the general orthodox perception is that Argentina should reduce domestic prices. Through what? Through of fiscal austerity and monetary contraction. Obviously, as the events showed, that's a theoretical possibility, but, but in reality, the country may go down first. The very own institutions that, that comprise the, the, the government and society may break down before you reduce domestic prices in the amount necessary to solve an exchange rate problem. Uh, the Argentine situation did not develop immediately in a crisis because, again, of the political business cycle of Argentina. Uh, De La Rua was just elected, and obviously he did not, want it, did not want to start his administration with uh, devaluation, especially because uh, the degree of dollarization in Argentina was much more higher than in Brazil. Uh, the crisis finally came uh, in 2001. Why it didn't come earlier? In 2000, just after the devaluation, Brazil experienced a growth burst. The economy grew something around 5%, and again, that pulled Argentina and alleviated the problems of Argentina. But then in 2001, Brazil experienced another growth recession, this time by, not caused by foreign problems, caused by a domestic problem. Because of low investments in energy production during the 1990s, Brazil was on the brink of energy rationing. And because of a dry season in the country, most of Brazilian electrical power is generated by hydroelectric plants, 
there was a shortage of electric, electric power in 2001, and that led to a mild recession in Brazil. On the top of that, Argentina, with all, already, all its problems, there was a run, not only caused by Brazil, but the, you put that in the top of already uh, unsustainable situation. Uh, there was a run on the, on the banks and the emergency of regional quasi-currencies. Why? Because the, officially the Argentine currency was pegged to the U.S. dollar, so you could only issue another domestic currency if you have another dollar. That obviously meant a big liquidity crunch in Argentina, the way the economy adapts, the economy evolves, the way the agents uh, managed to circumvent that situation was to creating regional quasi-currencies, kind of state and regional bonds to substitute uh, the national money. And as we, those who kept track of Latin America know, there was a big social unrest, social unrest and political crisis. The inevitable devaluation and that default came at the end of 2001. But the st story didn't end there. Then there was another crisis, this time in Brazil in 2002. And as the, situation, as the Argentine situation started to improve, Brazil faced another run on the real. This time, this was a very a temporary phenomenon and due to political issues. Uh, in the last, second semester of 2002, with the looming election of Lula as president, there was a, there was a major capital outflow from Brazil. Basically, foreign investors and domestic investors were expecting a default, even though the, the, the candidate guarantee and affirm in every speech he made that he will not default. There was a sharp devaluation on the currency. There was an unprecedented increase in the country risk premium. The Brazil risk premium at some point reached a two, 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 four, sorry, 2,400 points. There was a sudden stop in foreign finance. Not only speculative capital flows, even those steady flows, commercial flows, stopped running in. So when Lula got, got started, he got a very critical situation. The country had no foreign credit. The exchange rate was in its highest level since we have a record since the uh, early 1970s. And inflation was on the rise because of the devaluation that happened in 2002. But the situation recovered. Uh, through a very prudent macroeconomic management and Brazil was able to reduce inflation and resume growth again at a slower pace than in other emerging economies. Argentina, after the crisis and after the favorable shock in its exchange rate, also has resumed to grow fast. And I think officially, as Mark said, every, every, every year people say the Argentina, the Argentine, the Argentine uh, expansion is a temporary phenomenon. It only, it's only, it will only last until the next year. So, it's, so far, it has lasted four years. Uh, what were the common, uh, obviously, if there is an Argentine in the audience, I apologize in advance. Obviously, our countries are different, and they are, have uh, their own di political dynamics, but there are some common elements. And the common elements that of that, those, that period for both countries were low international interest rates, favorable terms of trade, and a booming world economy, especially because of the, of the growing Chinese demand for commodities. And there was a sound fiscal policy domestically. What I mean by sound fiscal policy? I mean balanced budget. I don't mean a low government expenditure or a low tax burden. As a, you, can have a, you can have a sound fiscal policy even with a big government or with a small government. In that case, in the case of Brazil, the government expenditure actually rose, but the tax rose in the, in the same proportion. In the, in the, Classic case of the balanced multiplier effect, where you raise taxes and expansion in the same proportion that increases the level of economic activity. But obviously we are similar, but have different priorities. The priority in Brazil, for Brazil in the last four years was disinflation, reducing inflation. That was a clear priority, uh, especially in contrast to Argentina, where the priority was growth acceleration. Uh, the, the first little administration, as I said, started with an inflation rate of around 17% and accelerating. So reducing inflation was, again, a very important uh, objective. Where Argentina already had a low inflation because of the crisis, of the recession, deep recession that it was uh, up to 2001. What are the main lessons learned? And this, since we, the audience have, there are a lot of academics in the audience, as I 
feel a little bit ashamed of saying main lessons learned because we knew this all along. <laughs> but uh, what I, the reason I put this is that the, now that I'm on the other side of the, the debate, I mean the government, uh, sometimes even if you keep hearing the same ideas, the same ideas in the, in, the, in the academic debate, they still don't go through in the government. You have to have the media attention, you have to have the political support of the major uh, political groups, business groups. And so this is why I put here, in this sense, I put this here, main lessons learned. Why, what is my criteria? It's the kind of ideas that if you hear in a government debate, people will very quickly say, no, no, that's out of question. Even people that are not familiar with economics. And what are those issues that are out of question in the, in the economic debate? First, the fallacy of insufficient domestic savings. As I said, in Brazil was a classic example. We increased foreign savings, reduced domestic savings. Investment didn't vary much. So now people, there are still obviously uh, some people that advocate current account deficits as a way to promote growth, but that doesn't fly in the political debate of Brazil as of now. The inevita inevitability of the balance of payment constraint, now there is a sense that you need high export growth as a precondition for sustainable growth and development. Something that uh, Tony Tiro already emphasized in the late 1970s, but now is in the political mind, I think, in the leaderships of Brazil and Argentina. And there are many ways to fiscal balance. As I said, you can have a fiscal ba a balanced budget with high taxes and high spending, and low taxes and low spending. And the Lula administration showed that you can have a sound fiscal policy and still increase social transfers and promote uh, growth acceleration and income redistribution. Now the debate, for, this, for those who are interested in Brazil, now the debate in Brazil is turning to the, not, not actually, not only to the fiscal balance, because the debt-GDP ratio is going down, but as to the size of the state. It kind of resembles the same debate that the U.S. had in the beginning of the 1980s. What's the emerging consensus on exchange rate policy? exchange rate policy. Well, knowing or not, what the two countries have been doing is what I call an asymmetric dirty floating. Before you leave the room, let me explain what that technical term means. You have different response to exchange rate variations. If you have a devaluation, you respond traditionally. Increase interest rates to fight that, and you decelerate the growth of the economy. If you have an appreciation, instead of just reducing exchange rates, you buy reserves. You set a floor to the exchange rate. And obviously that floor is set at the level that you find it necessary for competitiveness reasons, for inflationary purposes. So what we have is the same kind of policy. Both countries have been accumulating a lot of reserves. In the last four years, Brazil, the Brazilian Central Bank and the Brazilian National Treasury bought together something around $142 billion index in the spot and in the derivatives market. And in that, they avoided a sharper appreciation of the, Brazil, of the Brazilian exchange rate. But obviously, the floors are different. Argentina has a much more depreciated exchange rate floor to and have a fast economic growth and increasing inflation. And this, the academic in me, are, is already tempted to make parallels. And Brazil has the opposite. It has an appreciated exchange rate floor, a slow economic growth compared to Argentina and to Asia, and a decrease in inflation. Brazilian inflation is actually 3.5 and going down. So actually, it's, I think it's, today is, is lower than the U, in the U.S. What are the new challenges? Inflation targeted versus growth acceleration. The debate right now in Brazil and Argentina is not much the debate on foreign constraint. Not that they, it doesn't exist. It exists. But it's not the major constraint now. Why? Because in in addition to a balance of payment constraints, you can have a self-imposed constraint. That was happening, for instance, in Brazil. If you want to disinflate fast, you impose a constraint on your growth rate. So the real issue now is that if you want to have a growth acceleration, how are you going to promote that? That may create some temporary conflicts with, uh, inflation, with uh, fighting inflation. And in Argentina, Argentina is growing very fast. There are some issues about whether you have an overheated economy. And there are, it's the opposite uh, idea. If you have a too slow convergence to uh, low inflation, that may eventually backfire. If you have a supply shock in the middle of the transition, if you have an increase in indexation, then inflation may 
as may stay high for a long time. Now I'm going to link again with East Asia. And there's also more structural debt. The first was a, uh, was a short run or a macroeconomic uh, problem. And there's the structural problem or situation that is affecting both Brazil and Argentina, which is what we call sinocentric glo globalization. Some uh, Brazilian intellectuals are, are using that term a lot recently, which is we have a mixed blessing. Uh, the current globalization led by China is, is characterized by the increasing demand for goods intensive and natural resources, mining, agriculture, and in the industries related to those products. This is good for Brazil and Argentina because those are countries that are very intensive in natural resources. But those sectors cannot generate enough employment, especially in an urban society. There is an increase in competition. On the other hand, there is an increase in competition in the market for labor intensive goods, which comprise most of the industrial jobs in Brazil and Argentina. So we have this. We have this kind of Dutch disease problem, but it's actually not the disease because Brazil and Argentina have lived with that throughout the 20th century. The difference is that when both countries were industrialized in the 50s and the 40s, they moved from a, very, from a predominantly agricultural society to an industrial society. Now they have a predominant, predominantly urban society with the same kind of problems. And how, you have to avo how to avoid a return to the enclave economy? Well, regional integration is one alternative because one of the advantages that Brazil has is the size of its market, domestic market, of the industrial policy, and more investment in human, uh, in human capital. To close, I cannot talk about the Asian crisis without mentioning capital controls. And what about capital controls, since I didn't touch it in my presentation? Well, there is an ongoing debate on Brazil also about the need and... and, and the importance of not ad adopting capital controls. And the debate to organize the debate is basically three points that are debated. Whether, whether or not you should impose entry controls on foreign capital, whether you should impose ex exit controls on resident capital, and whether you should use capital reserve requirements on financial institutions to kind of simulate capital controls. Uh, entry controls on foreign capital are not pretty much discussed because we're actually having the reverse. Uh, sorry. Exit controls on resident capital are not pretty much discussed because we're having the, reserve, the reverse situation. A lot of capital is flowing in. So there's some discussion whether you should uh, impose entry controls on foreign capital or not, but most in the academia. In the government, there's a, pretty, uh, there's a compromise of not interfering in the capital mobility in the fun function of capital markets. So one of way that this is done is mostly through the capital reserve requirements on financial institutions. What are the challenges of imposing or dealing with capital controls. First, we have the issue of unilateral, multilateral controls. Unilateral controls may, they may work temporarily, may, may alleviate short-run problems, but it's very difficult for a country to sustain them. But if the, the, the initiative is done multilaterally, then it becomes easy, easier. So that's why I endorse the ideas that were mentioned here uh, in, the, in the morning that we should try to make the IMF and all these multilateral institutions more democratic and more aligned to the interests of the developing countries. There's also the issue of asymmetric implementation. It's one thing when you have a controlled economy and want to decontrol it, when you want to deregulate. Then you can have a public debate on that, you can gain more knowledge and then do it gradually. When you already have an open capital account, any mention of controlling it can create a capital flight. So it's not the same thing. That's why the multilateral agreements are much more important if you're moving from a free capital mobility to a somehow controlled capital mobility. And given the history of Brazil and Argentina, there's also the issue that we have to recognize. In the past, the speculative bubbles were induced by the government because to stabilize inflation, you have to build a lot of international reserves and appreciate your currency. So maybe if you don't start it, you won't have the problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think because of the efficiency and discipline of the uh, three panelists, we actually have a good amount of time left for questions and answers. Uh, I would ask that if you'd like to ask a question, that you raise your hand. And before you ask your question, that you actually have the microphone in your hand. Uh, and if you could identify yourself and uh, keep your comments brief, that would be even, that would be great too. Down here. Uh, thank you, Mike Billington from Executive Intelligence Review. 
um, I have a lot of thing in my mind, things on my mind. But I think the thing that's, that I, I think of two things that are, that are common to what Dr. Mahathir did in Malaysia and what Kirshner has done in Argentina and also recently Korea in Ecuador. One is that they are insisting that physical economy and the welfare of the population has to be the determinant and that monetary policy and financial policy has to follow that, the opposite of you know, the Washington consensus. Uh, the second, though, is that in all, all three cases, different levels, they have identified the fact that, that you just mentioned, Mr. Bardoza, that you can take care of your local population, but you can't solve the global problem. And unless the Western institutions are willing to address the global crisis and go back to uh, what Mahathir called for, which is fixed exchange rates, a return to the original Bretton Woods policies, that there will be no end to these crises. And let me say on that, if you look at those economies where there's the biggest divergence between the monetary system and the, and the actual physical economy, the United States is the worst case. We're facing a general breakdown in manufacturing and infrastructure in the United States with a wild financial bubble. And I think looking at the solutions for Iberoamerica or for, uh, or for, uh, for Asia, has to be in that context of are we yet ready to demand a new Bretton Woods, a return to fixed exchange rates and long-term investments in big infrastructure, regional development projects globally, not just regionally, not, not just coming from the region, but on a global scale. Um, so I throw that out as a question and a comment. Oh, hi, Randall Dodd from the Financial Policy Forum. I just wanted to uh, ask Mr. Barbosa uh, whether he thinks that Latin America might be ready for the kind of proposals that the gentleman described that have benefited Asia so much in terms of uh, more coordinated local currency debt issuance and uh, uh, regional uh, arrangements to address financial crises. Uh, uh, would any of the panelists like to comment on either of the two comments? I'm, I'm do you have, or should we collect some comments and then? Uh, you should collect. Okay, great. Uh, gentleman here. I'm Don Shirk from PACT. I'd like to ask Mr. Barbosa to um, go out on a limb and speak for both Argentina and Brazil to give me what the opinion of the proposed Bank of the South would be in, in particularly Brazil and Argentina as opposed to uh, Venezuela and other countries. Uh, my question is uh, to Dr. Water, but uh, I think we, we face the uh, the crisis. We first uh, the, the first problem is to address the crisis, and uh, right now to avoid the crisis. When you look at uh, all these arrangement in Asia right now, are we uh, concentrating more on trying to? Uh, avoid the repeat of the crisis or preparing if there is any crisis in terms of uh, uh, the arrangement, the uh, instruments that uh, it is being designed, etc. Et what, what was actually uh, in the back of the mind uh, by uh, having all this, this, this kind of issue? Now, uh, my, my next uh, problem is, uh, I think my question is to Professor uh, 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 Gribble. When you sort of... Uh, uh, caution us on almost like the proliferation of trade and investment uh, framework. Uh, are you uh, seeing that uh, this is the new avenue for sort of uh, pushing liberalization the way uh, the Western uh, consensus, consensus in the past that in the end it is also endangering uh, many developing countries which may even uh, cause another crisis if there's any because if that is the case then uh, uh, I, I I felt that I what uh, uh, Professor Wade uh, 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 mentioning that most banks right now is very short-term oriented and your uh, uh, ideas about uh, developmental financial policy is even you know push uh, to the uh, uh, to the back more you know, that uh, because people or, or banks even are really 
concentrating more on a, a short term kind of activities. Um, Robert Wade, um, I wonder um, what the panelists think uh, um, as to whether um, the, the people and the interests who believe in a hard kind of neoliberal economic policy um, will, uh, before long, come back into positions of great um, influence. Um, I'm thinking, for example, of Brazil, uh, 1996. I don't remember whether it was the Minister of Finance or the uh, Governor of the Central Bank who declared that in Brazil today, that is in 1996, you are either a neoliberal or a neo-moron. It was as obvious as that. And just a couple of, year, uh, just a couple of years ago, um, Larry Summers, um, who is still at that time president of Harvard, blew up a young uh, lecturer at the Harvard Business School for writing a Harvard Business School case study that gave an even-handed account of Malaysia's capital controls, saying that um, on the one hand they had these benefits, on the other hand they had these costs. Larry Summers not only blew him up to his face, but he then spent uh, uh, his whole lecture for th that class of the Harvard Business School, which was a thousand people, a lecture which was meant to be about Larry Summers' views on the world economy, um, dedicated to the proposition that, capital con that the case study they had just heard, given by this man, was completely wrong because everyone knows that capital controls can never, ever work. And he said this with real religious passion. And I was struck. That, that was only two years ago. Larry Summers is just at, uh, waiting to, to push um, or for somebody else to push a set of reforms to completely liberalize world capital markets. So the question is, do you get any sense that these kind of really hard neoliberal ideas uh, could still have traction, political influence, in your countries? Thank you, uh, Basanta Chaudhuri, again, Elizabeth Town College and Rutgers University. Um, it's a general question to all of the panelists here um, that, uh, you know, it's basically whenever we have a crisis, if you cannot predict the crisis, it is sort of an emergency event or disaster, and we have disaster relief, like I'm, an analogy of a natural event. And then we learn from, you know, we learn lessons from past events. Of course, natural disaster, some of them may be predictable. We have early warnings, as um, Dr. Grebel mentioned, some of the early warning or initiatives. So uh, you can prevent, uh, uh, you know, a disastrous effects by evacuating people and other sort of relief measures, or we do post-disaster relief. Now, in this particular case, financial crisis that we have had, and we have a very great detailed accounting, historical event that took place, beginning 80s, we didn't go back further historically, you can go back, of course, uh, 80s, and culminating different episodes, starting with, for example, if you don't go back in the 80s, uh, Mexican crisis, Asian crisis, followed by Brazilian, Argentinian, Russian, etc., etc. Now, in each of these cases, since we have been learning lessons, in this case 10 years, um, some of the things that came out is that uh, we know the sources of the crisis, one, okay? If you know the sources of the crisis or the causes of the crisis, uh, it's a post-mortem, so to say. Uh, we are saying that this is the source of the crisis, therefore we get rid of this, you know, you have a cancer, you get rid of the limb, and your body will survive, you can continue to um, live. So question here is that are we suggesting or are we re uh, reaching a consensus that Washington consensus is bad, therefore we need some new wisdom? Or are we, predict, are we able to predict from the lessons that we have learned that these are the symptoms, some of the indicators that you can have early warning in, in, in initiatives taken so that we can predict, okay, somewhat accurately. Not like earthquake, we cannot predict, but here in this case, we can predict 
uh, as, you know, natural disaster cyclone or of that sort. So by watching, monitoring s through surveillance and other initiatives, some of them you mentioned that uh, in the ASEAN, uh, ASEAN case, um, that uh, it is possible to predict or indicate that this country or this set of countries are leading towards disaster because they're following this prescription or this kind of menu. Uh, to avoid those crises, they must follow others. So it's a question of a belief, what you believe in, right? So can you, uh, you know, the panelists shed some light that at the end of the day, after studying all these crises and the scenarios, we're able to uh, say a set of framework or a model which we can reach some consensus. I'm not saying that we have to agree, but saying that yeah, this model might work because the previous model did not work because it imposed uh, too many stringent conditionality. Therefore, if we avoid those conditionality, we can reach a different pure model and it might work. And therefore we can avoid crisis. Or if there is a crisis for some reason that is accidental, we could not predict, but there are measures in place, institutional and other, that can uh, reduce or mitigate the severity of human misery that we talk about uh, some other cases. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another question here. Hi. Leonardo Bolamaki, the Ford Foundation, New York. Uh, that question is for Mr. Barbosa. <laughs> Nelson, now that you became a, a policymaker, and I should add a uh, high level policymaker, maybe you can give us an idea about uh, why the Brazilian priorities didn't change from disinflation to growth. Uh, I know that we all, we all know that uh, it's not only a matter of policymakers' ideas, it also has to do with interests and the business community, etc. But the question now is, given the highly successful uh, inflation targeting and inflation control, uh, in Brazil for years, what's, wh who's against change the priorities from inflation to growth? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nandini Kuti. I'm an independent consultant. Uh, my question is perhaps off the topic, but I'm still asking it with the purpose of exploring if there could be some connection. And perhaps my question is addressed to Nelson Barbosa, because when I look at the Brazilian economy, the most outstanding feature of it is its very extreme economic inequality and lack of uh, economic mobility at the lower level. So is there any way that the international arrangements that we are talking about today, the monetary arrangements, have an impact on that situation? All the way in the back. My question is for the gentleman from ASEAN. Um, as I was looking at your presentations, the um, initiatives for bond market, develop bond market development um, certainly make sense, is widely supported, wide consensus on it for the need for stronger, deeper capital, local capital markets. But the Chiang Mai initiative, um, I've been um, a little bit confused about it because it seems that the initiative is to um, allow current countries to borrow reserves during a time of crisis, but yet the situation now is that so many of these countries have so many reserves. So what I've often been wondering is, um, what are the um, political or economic motivations that are continue to push the Chiang Mai initiative along? Is something I've been very wondering about. And then my um, second question is, is you know, oft many people here are wondering about issues of surveillance and conditions on lending of money, but yet this is exactly what ASEAN is is embarking upon next is that as they lend this money through Chiang Mai, trying to develop this surveillance and conditions. So I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit, perhaps where you see that developing. Um, so I'm going to throw in a third more question, and I suppose you could answer any of them that you want. Um, my third question is, is um, you know, I suppose this whole conference has been about the East Asian financial crisis, crisis. and as the principal economist at ASEAN, if you can make your wish list of what it is that you think ASEAN and ASEAN finance ministers should really be focusing on and perhaps on, are not for whatever reasons of, you know, as you know, Mr. Barbosa from Brazil said, there's often political mandates, political issues. But if you thought there were certain things that really need to be focused on that perhaps are not getting due attention, I was wondering what your wish list would be as the principal economist of ASEAN. 
uh, there's obviously a lot of interest in the uh, talks, th three talks today. Um, maybe we have time for just one last question here and then give the speakers a chance to comment uh, in turn. Uh, do you have a question all the way in the back? I preface uh, my uh, question with, the, with an apology for having to be out for part of the meeting. So if this has already been discussed, don't bother to respond. But I've been struck in listening to this, uh, which is uh, this discussion, which is based on the Asian financial crisis, its impact, and so on and so forth, that uh, there's been little, if any, mention of either Cambodia or Vietnam. Uh, who are doing remarkably well, and I have not yet uh, deep enough into my research to understand whether they followed the prescriptions of the fund, the bank, they did it their own way, or whatever the case may be. And if you'd care to to respond to that, if you have time in this multiplicity of questions, it would be very interesting. Thank you. Um, I, we have time, I think, for about five minutes each from each of the uh, of the speakers, and then we might have even a little bit of time left at the end for continuing questions. Okay. Uh, Dr. Warpat, do you want to go first? Thank you. Uh, let me respond to the various comments and questions um, collectively. And, and I would like to um, look at this from two aspects. The first is on crisis prevention, and the second is on crisis management. Now, as far as crisis prevention is concerned, I believe the, my, my personal views is that, um, first of all, it is very difficult to predict what the future crisis will be. Um, so I think the, the best policies towards crisis prevention is to maintain sound macroeconomic policies, um, to also maintain robust uh, banking and financial systems, and to develop your capital markets. Now, as far as sound macroeconomic policies and the well, let me, let me first talk about some macroeconomic policies. And this is where the ASEAN 7 process and the economic review and policy dialogue are meant to address. Um, and these are complemented by the early warning system. Even though I, I mentioned earlier that it is difficult to predict future crises, but, but of course, uh, early warning systems are usually built from past crises. And uh, of course, if, if there are certain developments that mimic past crises, then we can um, at least uh, flag certain warnings that uh, some vulner vulnerabilities have occurred and, and that might warrant some policy uh, actions. Now, as far as robust uh, financial system and well-development capital markets are concerned, I think this is where the Asian Bond Markets Initiative uh, is trying to contribute, particularly in terms of the development of bond markets, particularly local currency denominated bonds. Um, the Chiang Mai Initiative, I believe, is meant uh, to, to make crisis management more effective and efficient. Um, of, of course, you, you're right in saying that um, Right now, many ASEAN countries are inundated with foreign reserves. Um, why would they need to borrow reserves from this uh, facility if most uh, crisis-affected countries have already 40, 50, or even 70 billion U.S. dollars in reserve? Um, as, as I said, this is crisis management um, facility, and of course, uh, under present situation, I don't think they would need to activate this, uh, this facility at the moment. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, this is to um, help countries who are in balance of payment difficulties. Of course, with this high level of reserves, I don't think they will be in that kind of situation soon. Uh, but this is meant for the longer term. Um, I mean, capital flows come in and out. And, and of course, when they come in, they come in in trove. But when they go out, they might also go out suddenly and in, in large quantity. And I believe the CMI is meant for that purpose, um, particularly um, learning from the 
the past crisis, uh, where I believe one reason that the some of the crisis affected countries um, experienced large depreciation, uh, and that's partly because um, even though they were in the IMF program, the funding uh, came a bit, I mean, too little and too late. And that's the, the I think, main intention of the CMI, in order to, 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 to help countries uh, to have access to reserves uh, in order to, to address their balance of payment difficulties as early as possible. Um, lots, lots of really interesting issues were raised. I'll just comment on, on a few of them. Um, on the question of are we ready for for a new Bretton Woods? I think that's 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 an interesting question. And of course, it does require that we figure out who the we is. I know I'm ready for a new Bretton Woods, um, but I I don't think um, that that most politicians and policymakers in the U.S. are ready for a new Bretton Woods, and certainly our, our colleagues at the IMF, I think, are not ready for a new Bretton Woods um, either. And certainly, uh, were we to think creatively and maybe be fortunate enough that there would actually be political will behind a new Bretton Woods kind of initiative, it would require that there is a large-scale support for capital control, something which I think is quite controversial because we know it would be very difficult, if not impossible, and I, I think impossible, um, to reestablish some kind of a system of pegged exchange rates, even if they were crawling pegged exchange rates without the widespread use of capital controls. And that in and of itself, of course, is quite a, is quite a challenge politically at the present time. So I, I think um, the new Bretton Woods idea had a lot of currency in the immediate aftermath of the East Asian crisis when there were lots of discussions about new international financial architecture. It seemed like that was leading us toward a new Bretton Woods, and then that, that movement largely uh, died out within the official policy community um, here in D.C. As far as the, the issue about whether there's anything like a Chiang Mai initiative in Latin America, and I know Nelson will, will no doubt want to comment on that, I would just say that for my part, uh, Chavez's proposal or pre-proposal that he's looking at for the Bank of the South idea certainly isn't analogous to the Chiang Mai initiative because it doesn't seem to have quite the, the multilateral flavor of the Chiang Mai initiative. Um, obviously, Venezuela would play a much more hegemonic role um, in the Bank for the South proposal, so we can draw, I think, a direct analogy, but it's at least suggestive of a kind of regional approach um, to trying to think about ways of providing financing for social development and to try to provide uh, mechanisms for responding to financial crisis that might actually have as an important component country ownership um, over those strategies and responses to crisis. So I'm, I'm interested in seeing the, that proposal being further articulated. Um, the issue of BITs, bilateral investment treaties and, and bilateral trade agreements, and whether they're a new mechanism for promoting liberalism, I think the, uh, the person who, ra who raised the comment um, also uh, gave, gave his view, uh, get, at least gave my view in that, which is to say I think that these agreements have become the new mechanism for promoting liberalism, certainly not the only mechanism, the kinds of standards and codes and surveillance that Robert Wade spoke about earlier this morning, I think are another mechanism for promoting liberalism liberalism, and I've personally been lately quite interested in the way that bilateral trade and investment agreements have become another mechanism for promoting a version of Washington consensus policies that's even more extreme than the original Washington consensus version of the policies. They were really hard neoliberal um, view, and I think that's what's so dangerous about those policies and so uh, troubling about those policies, and I think they do also introduce a greater risk for financial crisis because within those agreements, as I mentioned in my remarks, um, there's a kind of fundamentalist opposition to any kinds of capital controls, even the capital capital controls that countries might impose temporarily once a financial crisis has emerged. And so I think in that sense, they induce greater risk to the global financial system. Um, as far as the issue of whether 
hard neoliberal ideas have traction today. Uh, but I think there's, there's lots of evidence that this kind of fundamentalism, this hard neoliberalism um, exists and is thriving in many important quarters, like within some segments of the U.S. Treasury, particularly those um, that seem to have a kind of fundamentalist opposition to capital controls and are trying to push um, that agenda even through the back door, um, through trade agreements. Um, Larry Sum the, the example of Larry Summers was certainly quite, quite interesting um, as well, and I thought this morning's uh, comments by our colleague from the IMF were also quite revealing in this connection in his initial remarks, uh, capital controls were verboten, but then when pushed, said, well, okay, I don't really mean it always. Sometimes they're okay. If they were already in place, then, then they might be all right, but we don't want to encourage anyone to actually impose capital controls. So I think for many, many economists, there is almost a kind of religious opposition um, to capital controls. Uh, but there are some signs, I think, that there are at least some fractures within the negotiating team on the U.S.-Singapore and the U.S.-Chile free trade agreements. There was some interesting tension among members of the U.S. negotiating team where some, and these were the people, of course, who were ultimately victorious, were able to push the view that these countries should not be allowed to impose capital controls in a time of crisis, even temporary capital controls. But in the kind of post-mortem on the negotiations for those agreements, there was at least evidence that some members of the U.S. negotiating team thought that it was inappropriate to even introduce the idea of capital controls in a trade agreement. And so that, that's, that's a bit of a fracture, I'd say, within the establishment within the U.S., but I think nothing to get hugely excited about. Um, a few, few other issues um, that came up. As far as the political drivers of Chiang Mai, I mean, just speculating here, I think sovereignty is a huge political driver behind the Chiang Mai initiative, that the experience of dealing with the IMF during the East Asian crisis was so humiliating to so many countries in East Asia that I think that's helped to fuel political momentum um, around regional cooperation and regional responses to financial crises. Um, the question about Vietnam that, uh, that John raised, I, I don't know anything about Cambodia, but, but what has been interesting is to see the way Vietnam and Uganda, for that matter, have become the new darlings. And so when one looks at IMF reports these days, Vietnam and Uganda are the kind of new East Asian miracle economies, and I think it's, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not expert on either country uh, by any means, but I've become very interested in trying to figure out what is it that they're doing right, and is it really an accurate representation of what these countries are actually doing right um, or not. Um, the last issue that I just wanted to comment on is the early warning systems. Um, comment. Uh, it's certainly true that early warning systems can identify vulnerabilities and that it's very important to identify macroeconomic and financial vulnerabilities. So I'm not opposed to that project, but I think without coupling a policy response, the mere identification of a vulnerability is like yelling fire in a, in a crowded theater and can actually just bring on the crisis more quickly. And so for that reason, um, I think that the early warning model actually can make matters much worse if they panic investors without having some kind of a mechanism to then constrain their behavior after the fact. Nelson? Well, uh, there are many questions. I'll try to answer as many as I can. It's on. In fact, it's close. Oh. Hello? No. No. Come on. I think you have a set of trap from me here. Yeah, let me switch chairs. Oh, sorry. Uh, first, the coordinated local currency and the Banco del Sul. Uh, Coordination, macroeconomic coordination in Latin America basically means coordination between Brazil and Argentina as of now. They're the major economies, and if you take Merkel, Sul, both of them together, it's 98% of the population, 98% of the GDP. So it's basically a question whether the, macro, the business cycle of those two economies are aligned or not. 
Uh, I think right now, as I said, Argentina is in a situation of a little bit high, higher inflation than in Brazil, in Brazil it feels lower growth than Argentina. So as of now, I think the possibilities of coordination are not uh, strong, but there's, there's the, in the agreements that we have, the, there are some initiatives in, into that direction for the long run. As for the Bank of the South, the, well, on this, obviously I don't speak for, uh, for Argentina. I just presented a Brazilian view of Argentina. Uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, Brazilian position on that, well, the discussions so far is, are very preliminary. There were the different ideas whether this bank will function as a regional IMF or as a regional world bank. The Brazilian position so in the debates uh, is, is for a regional development bank. Why? Because we have a very good experience of our own national development bank, the BNDS which lends approximately $30 billion annually and has been a major force for developed driving force for development and growth in Brazil throughout its history since its creation in 1954. And because of its own regulation, this our national bank cannot lend freely abroad. So this, uh, the creation of a regional development bank may fulfill that space. But as I said, the conversations are still very preliminary, so we're still hearing and uh, presenting some positions. Uh, about Leonardo, why the priorities didn't change? Well, I think they changed, uh, especially because if you, if you know that, if you consider that Lula was reelected on the, on the program about to accelerate growth. I mean, his main, one of his main points is that the second administration will be the administration where we, where we will accelerate growth. We reduce inflation, stabilize the economy, and redistribute the income during the first administration. But obviously Brazil, uh, not being in a crisis situation, being a large economy, all these changes are gradual. And one of the features of the economic policy under Lula is the gradualism. All these changes are done very gradually, so it may take a while for this to become more clear. But I, one evidence of that I point to the fact that the government recently uh, annunciated the Growth Acceleration Program, which we, uh, consists basically of an increase in public investment, reducing the primary surplus without compromising the, the reduction in the debt-GDP ratio. Uh, about economic inequality, yeah, Brazil is known for, for its high economic inequality and, and <clears throat> well, social mobility, I, 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 I have read different positions. Some they say Brazil has a high social mobility, but uh, high inequality, and others in the direction that you that you said. Well, in the this last three years, there was a big change. Poverty levels were reduced substantially. Uh, the Gini coefficient fell. Brazil no longer is the first. I think it's the f fifth or sixth. And one of the reasons that happened is that despite this. A compromise to fight inflation, the first administration also was compromised to redistribute income. So the minimum wage rose substantially. There was the uh, expansion of, of income transfers programs to the poor, and that what was, it was be behind uh, the reduction in the poverty and inequality uh, indexes. Well, <clears throat> when will they come back? I don't know uh, whether neoliberals will come back or not. Just one point, the, the person that said that was the president. Fernando Henrique Cardoso, that said, what well, people are neoliberals or neomorals. And then, just in a, this year, he gave an interview where he says, and one journalist, economic journalist, asked him, oh, well, why did you let that happen? Did you, did you know that it was, ended, it was going to end in a crisis? And, he, and now he says, well, you know, at the time, nobody told me. There was no disagreement. So the, the people that, that knew that there would be a crisis who had spoken louder. So this, this thing's changed, that's life. And it's part of the political debate. I think, oh, it may come, but not, well, what's that? History doesn't repeat itself. And it may come back, but not the same format. Why? Especially in Brazil, because in the Lula administration, I believe Kirchner did the same, included millions of people in the formal economy, in the formal society. And today, the main uh, neoliberal propositions in Brazil is actually to go back, to reduce the minimum wage, to cut 
social expenditures. So it's basically you're telling 20, 30 million people, know what you had in four years, now go back. I don't think that's politically feasible. So they'll have to come up with a different proposition. But that I leave to them. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much. Um, that was a, a lot of questions uh, for our uh, three panelists to comment on. Um, I think at this point, unfortunately, we're going to have to close, and uh, Bumiko would like to make some uh, concluding remarks at this point.